Hey everybody, welcome back to another live stream from Synapse Care Solutions. And this is our final week in IVH prevention and care. This week we have a presentation from Lauren Heimel. She is the clinical nurse specialist at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. And she's gonna present to you their unit-based protocol for managing babies who have post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. So she's gonna go through all the tools, the bedside tracking, and some of their unit performance goals and, and how they got to standardizing this after um, kind of reviewing the literature. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this presentation from our 2019 conference in San Diego. California. I can't believe it's been so long since this presentation. I did talk to Lauren and make sure that this was reflective of their current practice, and it still is. So I hope that you enjoy this. If you would like to get the slides and other resources that Lauren mentions in this presentation, go ahead and click either the link in the show notes below or scan the QR code here on the screen, and we'll get you hooked up with all those resources. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe this video. It tells YouTube that you like videos like this. It helps us to rank and to be able to bring you more free content. So without further ado, I hope that you enjoy this presentation and I'll see you at the end. Miss Lauren Heimel is somewhere. Here she is. Lauren is the mother of four. She currently resides in Southern New Jersey. She has 17 years of NICU experience at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It lasts 11 as a neonatal CNS. She is a nurse lead for the NeuroNICU team and is currently assisting with a neurological assessment study in conjunction with the PICU at CHOP. In addition, Lauren collaborates on unit harm prevention and quality improvement initiatives and serves as a resource for nurses and medical teams for clinical care of patients. She's gonna to talk to us about their IVH pathway for post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Welcome, Lauren. Okay, so I'm here to discuss today our post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus pathway that we developed at Children's Hospital in order to improve the overall care of these kids in our unit. I don't have any disclosures related to this talk. We already talked a little bit about hydrocephalus and what it is, but a condition in which there's an increase in CSF that leads to an abnormally large head for the baby. It could be due to an obstruction of the CSF flow within the brain, due to atresia within the ventricular system or from some kind of blockage, such as a blood clot, or there could be a reason for overproduction of CSF. As we go through some of the Slides show photos of our patient family ed documents that we have created at CHOP. So this is one piece of the hydrocephalus information that we provide to families. We're fortunate that we actually have an illustrator that works in our hospital who helps us create these and draws everything for us. And we, as nurses and physicians in the NICU, get to provide input to him. For our preemie population, 25% of premature infants will have some kind of IVH. 10% of them will be severe forms. And Diane already talked a little bit about the classifications and that we're looking at mild, moderate, or severe. So 10% will be the more severe, grades three and four. And up to half of those severe cases will develop progressive hydrocephalus and post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. So what do we do to treat these kids? We wanna relieve the increased intracerebral pressure within their brain. And at our hospital, we found we didn't really have a great standardized care and treatment plan, and one of our docs did a survey of the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium database hospitals, their level four NICU throughout the country. We did a couple years ago, we're up to about 34 hospitals in the consortium. At the time, I think we were, there were somewhere around 20, 23 or 24 respondents. But when we surveyed, there was huge variation across all the centers as far as when do they intervene and how do you intervene for these patients. So it just helped us to clarify that we needed to find some kind of standardized management. So we started on pathway development and wanted a consensus-based guideline. So we wanted a standardized assessment of the ventricular size so that we were all looking at things the same way. We wanted standardized intervention criteria so we would intervene the same way at the same times. To find time points for conversion from a vent ventricular access device to a VP shunt if necessary. And then another thing that we did that helped a lot in our unit was weekly rounds with neurosurgery. So it's something that I, as a CNS in the NICU, organize each week. We chose Thursdays based on surgical OR schedules. Thursday mornings when I get to work, I send the team that's gonna round, which includes a neonatologist, a neurosurgeon, myself, the neurosurgical nurse practitioner, and usually the neonatal NP or PA also joins us. I'll send the list of active neurosurgical patients in our unit, 
and then say, let's meet at bed 90 at 11 a.m. We all convene and we go bedside to bedside, talk to the families, the nurses, and do an assessment of the patient. And that has really helped everybody to stay on track as we develop this pathway and make sure that we can stay compliant and that everyone's aware of the timeline. And nursing is included in this for all rounds. So this is, I know it's small to see, but this is what our pathway looks like online. And it is available to anybody on CHOP's website, so it's available to outside institutions. You can access it. So it goes through from the beginning, and it talks through when a team could consult CHOP, when a baby would need to come to us. A lot of our surrounding hospitals don't have neurosurgery, so they can't intervene at their local hospital. They would refer to us. We would transfer the baby and provide surgical intervention at the main hospital. It goes through whether we're going to observe the patient, put in a VP shunt, put in a reservoir, or if they need an external drain. And it goes through nursing management. So up until about two or three years ago, Pathways had no nursing interventions. So my involvement was to make sure that we included nursing interventions so that nursing would want to even reference the document and could be compliant with plans of care. So one of the big things was looking at ventricular measurements and standardizing this so that the outside institutions who were performing head ultrasounds could do the measurements and have the data that when they called for referrals, they could provide the information. So we look at frontooccipital ratios, which the formula is there, but if you look at the widest distance across the frontal horns of the brain, which is A, the widest distance across the occipital horns, the B, and the widest biparietal diameter, and then you calculate it on multiple slices. The radiologists do this. They take the measurements and they're reported out in our head ultrasound reports. So that's one, the FOR. There's also the frontal and temporal horn ratio, which just looks a little bit different. And there's literature published, a lot of it was from the late 90s, that this is reliable way, and then some later in the 2000s. And this is what our team decided we would use for our measurements. So for both, if the ratio ends up being 0 0.4, they're considered in the normal range, and we will usually just observe them and monitor them. Mild hydrocephalus up to about 0 0.55, moderate when you get closer to 0 0.6, and then severe 0 0.7. And there was good interrater reliability for this. So when the kids fall into the observation on the pathway, so their measurements on head ultrasounds aren't showing that they're getting into the moderate or more severe hydrocephalus, we'll continue to obtain weekly head ultrasounds for three weeks. So this could be done potentially at the outside institution. Sometimes they're already coming to us. In our hospital, we try to do them on Mondays so that it's just consistency. Nursing performs daily head circumferences and documents it in EPIC, and it's reported out every morning at rounds. So we watch the rate of head growth. If it's greater than one and a half centimeters a week, that's a flag for concern. And then also looking at their bradycardia episodes, if they're having any kind of spells, we might look at it, see if it's related to the head. If their head circumference continues to have stable growth, after those three weeks of weekly ultrasounds, we usually will space out to monthly unless there's another indication that comes up that might say we need to do something more. The next option is a ventricular access device, especially for our little preemies who are less than 1,500 grams. So a ventricular access device, for us, we use the Omaya Reservoir. It drains CSF into a reservoir that then we can tap or into a subgaleal or supraclavicular pouch. Like I said, we use the uh, Omaya, and it allows for us to treat the hydrocephalus while the baby is still growing, so if they're too small, like I said, less than 1,500 grams, that we usually can't get a VP shunt into them very successfully. Or if they've had a big bleed, our neurosurgeon likes to put in OMI initially to really let that the blood clear to, so that there's less risk of clotting of the VP shunt. So for us in the NICU at CHOP, we have great agreement from our neurosurgeon, and we place all these OMIAs at the bedside. So they're little, they're micropremies, they're in incubators, Traveling to the OR, they were all getting super cold, and then we were dealing with the ramifications of all the cold stress. And he, the one time we had a little one who was probably maybe 1,000 grams, and the CNS, who was also working at that time in our unit, said, why do we have to bring this kid to the OR? Why can't we just do it here? And the neurosurgeon said, I'll do it here. Where do you want me to do it? And from then on, he's agreed and gotten his whole team 
to agree that we do these in the NICU and we have much better temperature management and stability of these kids, which is great. So again, less than 1,500 grams, grade three or four IVH, we expect them to have decent life expectancy at that point. FOR or FTHR is into the moderate range. Another reason is abdomen not favorable for VP shunt. So this is a lot of our kids who've had medical neck or surgical neck and putting in VP shunt at that point is just of great concern. And then they need to have at least two of the following, bradycardia, split sutures, or a bulging fontanelle. And our definitions are spelled out in our pathway so that it's very clear for nurses and the medical teams. So bulging fontanelle, anything that's above the level of the bone while the baby is calm and sitting, which sometimes we all know is difficult to obtain, especially the calmness. Split sutures, so we describe it as roughly a fingertip, greater than two millimeters, measured about a centimeter from the fontanelle. And bradycardia, we defined as greater than or equal to three episodes requiring interventions or lasting more than 30 seconds in a 24 hour period that we can't explain otherwise. So how do we care for these patients? Again, weekly head ultrasounds, we try to standardize to every Monday just to make it easy. Daily assessment by nursing and the team of fontanelles and sutures. And when we do our Thursday rounds, we all will assess and make sure we are all in agreement of what we're um, finding. We have on more than one occasion on Thursday rounds found that, oh, the kids definitely had a change since yesterday. The surgeon might feel more concerned for doing surgery at that point or intervening. Criteria for tapping the reservoir, an increase in measurements on the head ultrasound. Their fontanelle is bulging, their sutures are more split. And then if they have any of the increase in Brady's or anything like that. We have taught all of our, or most of our frontline clinicians to be able to tap at the bedside. So our nurse practitioners and PAs in the NICU will perform the tapping with nursing as the assist at the bedside. So it's nice and easy. They'll tap at the bedside. They'll let neurosurgery know. They'll put in a procedure note and neurosurgery just will track it that way. We are also able to transfer a good number of our kids back to birth hospitals after they've had their OMIA, as long as the referring hospital is comfortable to continue tapping there. And our teams have gone out and helped train at some of those other hospitals or some of our staff have moved from our hospital to some of our surrounding ones and have taught once they've moved there. And then any uncertainty, we just consult neurosurgery. They'll come down, do an assessment, and decide whether we should tap or not. So here's what we use, butterfly, syringe. We do a CHG prep and generally tap for 10 mLs per kilo. We will use lidocaine cream at sometimes if they're old enough. We do developmental supports. We have involved child life as well as nursing, music therapy during the procedure. Only if there's symptoms, do we, like every time we tap, we don't routinely send for we don't routinely send for culture, no. If there's concern, then absolutely, but not routinely. This is the portion of our pathway that goes over when we should convert from a ventricular assist access device to a VP shunt. So we'll continue to observe them, continue monitoring their head ultrasounds, looking at how often they're requiring taps. So some kids, we place the reservoir and they might get tapped a couple times in the first week or two, and then we have kids who could go and when we're doing Thursday rounds, it's, oh, we haven't tapped them in a week. Nope, we haven't, still haven't tapped them in a week. And they'll go home with their Omaya never getting tapped beyond the first couple days after having it placed. Others end up getting tapped almost daily. Just depends on the kid. We look at their weight. We look at their abdomen. Are, is it favorable to place a shunt? Are, have they grown enough? And then the surgeons will order usually a CT with NAV in order to look for the best access area. And then also depends, sometimes they'll put in an external third ventriculostomy if the kid meets criteria. VP shunt, it's permanent CSF diversion to the peritoneal space. We have had a few kids who have had an atrial shunt put in because their abdomen wasn't favorable, but it's really rare. And again, if they're tapping it usually almost daily. This ultrasound image is actually the same patient that was on the ultrasound image on the observation slide earlier. This is one of him status post his VP shunt. So our VP shunts, we send them to the OR for that surgery. We don't typically do that at bedside. 
although we have externalized them at bedside. We send them all in a warmer bed or in an incubator with the shuttle because we have found that in QI work, all of our kids who go for neurosurgery were coming back cold just after having head prep and OR temperatures. So we send them all into the OR on a warmer bed or in the incubator to maintain thermoreg, and we've seen great improvement there. Regular routine nursing neuro assessments, head of bed elevated to prevent site leaking, no routine dressings over the site. We monitor for seizures and infection. In our hospital, our neurosurgeons like us to clean three times a day with sterile water and J&J &J head to toe body wash. And one neurosurgeon has found that he thinks it does better for keeping the sutures um, intact, but then helping them to dissolve at a normal rate. And then once we do it three times daily for two weeks, then we'll do it daily until they dissolve. And that's how we send families home, to just do a daily site cleaning until there's no more sutures present. Head circumference daily and electrolytes daily for the first couple days. We stress for our nurses really watching and monitoring the site for skin breakdown. We have had some kids with breakdown at the incision sites, especially the kids who are requiring NIPPV and the headgear going over it. And we've had development of pseudo meningocele from that, from the headgear, and had some issues trying to maintain that. A lot less common in our hospital, but sometimes done, is the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So it's newer in infants and kids where they use an endoscopic procedure and they create an opening in the floor of the third ventricle to allow CSF diversion between the third and fourth ventricles. And there's varied success with it. Sometimes, depending on the baby, it could actually just close back off again and you're back to the square one. We follow the same periop care as we do for VP shunt. They usually do an MRI on post-op day one and the following of electrolytes is huge because a lot of times these kids have sodium imbalances. And so we monitor their sodiums very closely. External ventriculostomy is more common and we use it if we're unable to place a VP shunt due to other clinical concerns such as infection, meningitis, sometimes with the unfavorable abdomen. We did have a baby who they could not place a shunt in his abdomen and that he, they had tried the heart, but with his heart disease, that wasn't working either, and he lived with us for quite a long time with an external ventric. So periop care, very similar to VP shunt. As nurses, we monitor the drainage hourly, alert the team if there's any drastic change. The rate of drainage is controlled by altering the height of the chamber. That as a CNS is something, especially with our newer staff that I'm providing in the moment, just in time education for our nurses to really understand what changing the level does. And we wanna see about 10 to 15 mLs per kilo per day. Hopefully the fluid is clear. If it gets cloudy, alerting the team over concern for infection. If we already have a known infection, you might expect it to be cloudy and then hopefully it clears over time with antibiotics. We have determined for us, ICP monitoring is not the norm and routine in this population for the post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus kids because they have their open fontanelles as a pressure pop off and we're not usually concerned about herniation. So we don't need to monitor ICP, which makes it a little bit easier. So our team wanted to monitor compliance with peer practice for timing of interventions, monitor for infection post interventions and mo mechanical complications. Our initial data, so initial treatment choice compliance before the pathway when they went and did um, retrospective chart reviews, we had about a 42% would have been compliant with the pathway and post pathway. We were up to 59% and it's actually gone up even more since then. Conversion compliance was the same, both 100%. Thus provide the medical team's guidelines, especially when talking with families when they first are admitted about what to expect, timeframes, for when they can expect these interventions. And it, for me, it, I've noticed that it really gives nursing a voice to understand what's gonna happen and be able to help reinforce the medical plans with the parents. Here's just some numbers of our reservoir and shunt placement both before and after the pathway. So we were a little bit more patients prior, but we've seen, we've actually placed more EOMI reservoirs after the pathway. Still about a third of the kids require both OMIA and then eventual conversion to a VP shunt. And our complications were infection. So we had one VP shunt infection before the pathway, but didn't have any in this data set after the pathway. Our complications varied. So there were quite a few that were 
surgical site breakdown that had to go back for wound dehiscence and wound revision. And then the other big one was just that the shunt stopped working and they had to have a shunt revision. We are continuing to collect our data. We still do our neurosurge rounds weekly. We continue to revise all of our PFE documents to make those more user-friendly for the families. And then continual focus on surgical site infections for neurosurgery in our hospital is huge. And so just really monitoring for those surgical sites. If you guys have questions, just raise your hand. In our facility, we stopped using J&J because it has a byproduct of similar to formaldehyde. And so I was curious. It is, that is something, bathing, I say it's funny, bathing in our hospital I think is the hardest thing to do. We have a lot of strong opinions hospital-wide about bathing. The neurosurgeons are adamant about the J&J, and we had one family that was, their baby had myelomeningocele, and even for the myelocyte, they want J&J wash, but mom herself had an allergy, and she was a very involved mom, and she's, I want to be able to provide a bath to my baby, and I can't touch J&J without having my own reaction. And I said, then we're going to change. And so I did call the neurosurgeons and ask, hey, can we use something else? Mom brought in a product that would work for her. And they okayed it. But the head of neurosurgery, one of the heads, he finds that in his mind it helps with sight healing and not affecting sutures in a negative way. And he's very strong about the J&J. It is currently the only regular soap product we use other than CHG bathing. For our preemies, we just use sterile water. It is, but they're adamant about J and J. Is it the moisturizing aspect to the stitches? Is that why he likes it? Because I, I could see other things would be drying, so therefore your stitches are going to be on dry skin, which isn't going to be great. But did he ever say that's why I think it's awesome? He finds that he thinks that it doesn't make the sutures dissolve too quickly, but it does. It lets them dissolve at normal rate for the dissolvable sutures that they use for both the Milo repair and the shunt placement. Hi, I'm just curious, in the place that I was working at the time, it was pretty common the doctors and nurse practitioners would tap the fontanelle directly and, try, and avoid putting in any kind of a shunt or a reservoir at all. And some of those kids, that's all they needed for a couple weeks and they never had to have surgery. Is that done anymore, anywhere? Some places do, and even Diane was saying they will do LPs. But at our hospital, we, as long as I've been there, we've never routinely done just a Fontanelle tap or an LP for these kids. When I first started, I would say a lot more kids went for shunts. Thanks, Lauren. That was great. I wanted to just mention a little bit about our protocol at Sick Kids. We've developed an early intervention protocol for PHVD about a year ago, and so we just were correlating our one-year outcome data. And we do start with lumbar punctures for patients that are above the intervention graph. And we actually use a graph to graph our hydrocephalus based on the ventricular index and the anterior horn width. And we start with LPs and we'll do up to three serial LPs. And about a third of our patients get away with just having LPs to reduce their ventricular size. And then we'll put in an OMIA if they remain dilated after the three LPs. And the OMIA stays in permanently. And our nurse practitioner group will be the tappers of the OMIAs. And that usually happens every day for the first 14 days, trying to remove all of those dead blood cells that are floating around and irritants that are floating around in the ventricle. After 14 days, we will try to stretch out the taps and see how well the patients do about a third of the patients then go on to require a VP shunt. So we've got one third LPs only, one third requiring OMIAs, and one third requiring VP shunts. And what our plan is to look at their 18 month uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes to see if we've made any improvements. Because we really used to be a very late intervention hospital where we wouldn't intervene in these tiny babies until they had very severe hydrocephalus and were going straight to a VP shunt. So. I'm interested to hear about Lauren's work and hopefully we'll be able to share more information about our work in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Our question? Awesome. Our mail? Thank you so much, Lauren. 
All right, well, that's the end of this week's presentation, and I hope that you've enjoyed this review from beginning to end. We started in week one with Diane Wilson looking at post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation, very similar to what Lauren was talking about today. We started with that in week one, then we spent week two and week three with some nurses and nurse practitioners who are initiating IVH prevention programs here in the States as well as abroad, and then today we're wrapping up with this presentation. So I hope you've enjoyed this entire series. If you'd like to get some of the resources mentioned today or to see any of the replays from all month, go ahead and either click the link in the show notes below or scan the QR code here on this screen. I hope you've enjoyed all of these presentations this month and we'll see you next month. Bye!